How are we looking? Looks good. And you're set to start anytime. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, so uh, my name is Steve Brenner, and I'm with the Non-Game Bird Program here at Game and Parks. And I'm going to be presenting some work that uh, Joel and I did using some long-term data sets on black-billed magpies and black-capped chickadees here in Nebraska and the other parts of the north central U.S. and West Nile virus. So here we go. Uh, West Nile virus, I'd imagine most people are pretty familiar with the basics here. Uh, introduced pathogen, uh, mosquito-borne birds are both a reservoir and a host, meaning that they themselves can be infected and, uh, you know, get sick, but also a mosquito can bite them and transfer it to other animals, notably people. Uh, and as far as history in the U.S., first documented in New York City in 1999, and by 2002 had been documented in California. So and as well as our region. So basically spread across the country in a matter of three, four years. And just to give you an idea of, of the picture of West Nile virus, this is the last 20 years, just average human incidence for this disease. And you can see that, you know, the Great Plains, specifically the Northern Great Plains, you know, our neck of the woods is, is the hotspot. I mean, this is where a lot of the action is happening. And while this is of course concerning for people, we're worried about birds as well, talking about birds here. So uh, we felt it pretty important to kind of take a look at this as again, our region is a very hot region for West Nile virus. And just a quick bit on both species of interest here. So the black-billed magpie, uh, this to me is kind of a classic Western bird. Um, and you know, they are resident, resident species in the migratory. And you can see sort of in North America as well, just a classic Western bird. And in Nebraska, so this is a range map of magpies prior to 2001. And you can see that they're basically almost everywhere in the state, you know, never super abundant, but pretty much easy, relatively easy to find. Since then, however, uh, in this century, rapid declines of magpies in Nebraska. Uh, now, as you can see, pretty much very isolated pockets, mostly in the panhandle. Uh, this is a tier one species very concerning reduction distribution in numbers across the state. And it's worth noting that uh, magpies are part of the corvid family, which is like your crows and jays. And corvids uh, have sort of run the gamut of West Nile virus susceptibility. Of course, American crows are a really susceptible popular. Uh, they get hit pretty hard by West Nile. Blue jays, some research out east has shown that Initially, populations will get hit pretty hard with blue jays, but they have a pretty quick recovery time. So kind of on the lower end, and magpies, um, not no direct work done exactly on black-billed magpies, but on other magpie species and corvids, uh, pretty high susceptibility to West Nile virus. The other species of interest here is the black-capped chickadee. Um, very common. I, I think everyone's probably familiar with chickadees, sort of your classic feeder bird, basically the bird in the northern U.S. Uh, as far as in Nebraska, you know, kind of selective for breeding in the state, but you can find them pretty much anywhere, especially in the breeding season. Uh, but these guys also from work out east are known to be vulnerable to West Nile virus as well. And we didn't just pick these species in a vacuum. Uh, Joel and others really noticed that you know, basically in the 2000s that uh, annual winter surveys have noticed some pretty substantial declines of these species uh, kind of everywhere across the state. And this is just a quick figure that Joel worked up on of these winter surveys, birds per party hour at every one of these counts in the state. Uh, and this is for magpies. And as you can see, basically after 2000, things just really start crashing. So and, mag and uh, chickadees, you know, not as dramatic, but also seeing this like sort of noticeable decline, especially because they're so common. So we have this problem of these two declining species. And our question for this research was essentially, are these declines that we're seeing in these winter abundances any relation? What does West Nile virus, if anything, have to do with that? So to answer this question, a um, couple things you need. First, of course, we need data. And that first question is what data can we use or winter surveys to look at birds in a large region. Well, it just so happens, if you haven't heard of it, great resource is the Christmas bird count. This is sort of the 
like upper echelon, best long-term data set in this country for birds. Uh, you know, it goes back over a hundred years. It's conducted every winter, uh, end of the year, always between the 14th of December and, and the uh, beginning of January. And the counts themselves, if you've never done one, you, it's a 24 hour period, it's a whole day, if you wanna go that, uh, that, that hard. And it all happens within a 15 uh, di mile diameter circle. And the other great thing about this is, this is a completely community science, everything's volunteer, um, you can have participants that are, you know, like Joel Jurgensen, Nebraska's number one birder participating. You could have, you know, a first time, someone who's never used binoculars before, people who are dabbling in conservation, people that are really into it. So it's really a big, the Christmas bird count itself is a huge success story uh, when it comes to bird monitoring. So, and that is run by the Audubon Society. So here's a map of all the Christmas bird counts that we used for our study here. Um, and we had over 80 of these and it's a pretty large area. I mean, we're doing 10 pretty big states here. And we actually delineated that uh, into four smaller regions just for a little more targeted analysis as well. And this is kind of the, it's a gradient that makes sense. Uh, you know, like the Eastern region of this, Iowa and so on, obviously very different than, you know, the Rocky Mountain West there of, you know, Western Wyoming. And this is mostly delineated on things like precipitation, elevation. Um, and then you can see too, we have a whole section that's just the front range of Colorado there. And that's basically the Denver, Cheyenne, Colorado Springs. You know, that's like a megapolis right there. And just as far as, you know, people population and human development, that is stands out so much uh, as far as those counts are concerned from everywhere else. So we thought it prudent to sort of separate that area as well. Okay, so we have our data set to try to answer this question. Another way to, uh, a big thing to approach this with is to make sure what are other species besides the ones that we're concerned about and we know are susceptible to West Nile are other species uh, just showing similar patterns here. And the reason you wanna look at this is just basically to ch check yourself on this because if you know, we have species that are not known to be susceptible to West Nile following the exact same trends and patterns. At that point, it's probably not disease related. You know, we might be looking at, you know, some sort of inherent bias in where your counts are happening. Uh, you know, maybe there's been a big land use change that is affecting all birds. So you wanna just make sure with other species, you're not just repeating the same mistakes essentially. But we kind of have these two comparison species that we chose, uh, the blue jay and white-breasted nuthatch. And we picked these birds because as far as in our circles, these are the closest in terms of life history, distribution, and ecology to jays and chickadees. Uh, jays, again, another corvid. And as I mentioned before, they have this sort of mild response to West Nile virus. They definitely get hit hard, but they have shown to recover pretty quickly. So kind of on the lower end of the West Nile spectrum. And then nuthatches have no known big susceptibility to West Nile. So, uh, and then they're as similar as you can get to chickadees, you know, as far as cavity nesters, feeder bird, relatively common. And so the idea again is to just model these abundances as well. Make sure we're not looking at any sort of bias just in the way these counts were conducted as far as what the trends are doing. Okay, so we're checking that off. We have our similar species. And then the other last thing you need to sort of approach this question of these declines and abundances, how do you actually determine if it has anything to do with the arrival of West Nile virus? How do you actually model the abundances uh, in wintertime of chickadees and magpies and other birds? Well, uh, you use uh, hierarchical Bayesian modeling, of course. So we did a 30 year time period uh, of winter Christmas bird count data. And this was to capture the amount of time before West Nile virus, which we picked as 2002. That's like the definitive date. Uh, it may have been here earlier, but that's the definitive date for the Great Plains of West Nile virus is here. So we have a big chunk of years to monitor and model before West Nile virus. And then we have this other chunk of years basically after 2002 to present. Uh, where we also looked at abundances, and that's what we're going to compare. And this is the part where everyone's going to want to shut their computer and tune off I, a bunch of math, a bunch of Greek letters. I know it's terrible. The reason I'm putting this up is twofold. One, 
this model and this uh, way of analysis was developed in the early 2000s by like, actual ecological statisticians and people that know a lot. And this is kind of the established way to really get into CBC data. The other reason I put it up is just to hopefully explain in like a minute why it's important to sort of go through this slightly labor intensive, like why we can't just take the raw counts of what people saw on a Christmas bird count, throw it up and try to do a trend that way. And I boxed that uh, parameter there in the model, which is just an effort correction. It's not important to know mathematically what's going on in that effort correction, but intuitively the reason you need to be so careful with effort with Christmas bird count data Think about in our study here. Okay, so I've highlighted two counts that we uh, used. One is Denver, the other is up in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Just thinking about a Denver Christmas bird count is going to get like 50 to 60 participants every year. And that's going to be, you know, that's a lot of coverage. <laughs> Aberdeen, South Dakota, middle of winter time. I don't know if you're going to get much more than 10 people at best to go out and look for birds for 24 hours. And you know, if there's bad weather, gosh, you really don't want to go out and do it. Denver, there's going to be paved roads in almost every part of that circle. So you're going to be able to get to an extreme coverage of that circle. There's going to be better plowing, I assume. This is not to pick on Aberdeen, but I, you know, there's just very inherent differences with population going on here. And then the other reason you really need to correct for effort and do this sort of labor intensive model is kind of a mathematical assumption that the idea being that, oh, intuitively you think if we put in more effort, we're going to count more birds. So if you just do the number of observers and how much time they put in to counting birds, it's like, yeah, if I spend more time looking for birds, I'm gonna find more birds. The problem with that in the context of a Christmas bird count, this is a 15 mile diameter circle and that's all you have. So in reality, there is a finite number of individual birds that exist within that circle. Really, when you're talking about something like a magpie, which are very gregarious, they're kind of big as far as birds go, easy to see, easy to detect. Think about it too in like a large, you know, like a bald eagle or something. In reality, there's only gonna be, you know, eight or so bald eagles in your circle. And there comes a point where no matter how much more effort you put into counting that bird, there's still only eight bald eagles in that circle. And in the case of something like Denver, you know, where you have 60 people looking for the same six bald eagles, there's actually a case of potential diminishing returns. So that's what the math is essentially accounting for there. That's why I put the formula up. I'm sorry we all had to look at that, but I just wanted to kind of explain why we use this hierarchical Bayesian over dispersed regression stuff. Um, we can completely forget about that now and move on to the fun stuff. So doing all that math, um, the way we approach this is, so we do all the modeling for counts 1988 to 2001. And then we actually project using the, those sets of circumstances after West Nile virus, as if the counts you know, from 2003 to 2017 never happened. And then we compare that projection to what the actual counts did observe. So essentially what we're just gonna be looking at is did the actual observed counts, do they fall within a projection of conditions before West Nile virus existed? And if so, then we can't really say West Nile virus had anything to do with what's going on with these birds. Or if it's the latter, it's the other case that, you know, gosh, everything's way off with the projections, maybe West Nile virus has something to do with it. This will become abundantly clear right now with this results slide. Okay. So here's what we found with black-billed magpies. And the gray shaded areas and lines, those are the projections from conditions pre-West Nile virus. The blue dots are the observed abundances uh, in the counts. And what's probably gonna jump out at you, so in that central region, this is Nebraska, most of Kansas, the Dakotas, very dramatic decline after 2002. Uh, nowhere even close to what we would expect if there was no West Nile virus. Pretty much the same story in the front range region there. Um, you know, it's kind of near recent times sitting that low end threshold. That's a 95% confidence interval, by the way, that, that shaded area, but still very low. But then you look at the Mountain West, so this is like the Rockies and actual, you know, Northern areas in, in Montana. The observed counts fall pretty much exactly, you know, what we would expect without West Nile virus. Uh, so it's not uniform across the entire study area. Again, the real focal point there here is you can see it's almost 
comically off uh, in the central region, you know, really dramatic major declines there after West Nile virus. As far as chickadees are concerned, relatively similar story, just not as dramatic. Um, right off the, you know, initially after West Nile virus in the central region, pretty big decline. And same thing again in the front range, just staying right at that lower 95%, you know, lower tier, what, what you would expect. Um, kind of good news in the eastern area of our study region and in the Mountain West, again, those observed abundances match almost exactly the projections from pre-West Nile virus, so that's pretty good. And again, just focusing on the central, this is our region. Um, you know, it, it's sort of good news that it's matching back up with, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of leveling off, it seems, but it is like overall a decline, you know, that not much is really going up since 2002. It's just sort of holding steady and there seems to be maybe just an inherent decline going on in the 90s anyway with chickadees, which is sort of a bummer. Uh, as far as our comparison species, they did their own thing. They actually most, in almost all cases, followed uh, the projections, again, given conditions pre-West Nile virus. White-breasted nuthatch actually increased a lot in uh, our area in the central region. So this is, again, another thing just sort of pointing to probably West Nile virus is definitely having something to do with these declines in magpies and so on because our comparison species are doing kind of a completely different pattern here. Uh, we did do some very simple linear models with looking at climate. So we just looked at the trends in magpies and chickadees uh, as it relates to annual precipitation and average January temperatures in the circles. We did find that um, trends for magpies and chickadees increase with increasing precipitation. January temperatures, we didn't really have anything significant. But this also points to West Nile virus because transmission rates are higher for West Nile virus in warmer, drier climates. So again, as that annual precipitation goes up, we actually found that magpies and chickadees were also going up. So you could look at it the other way and say that as you know things get warmer and drier, it was getting worse for magpies and chickadees. So again, West Nile virus. Um, okay, thank you. This is just sort of the summary. Uh, this is just the annual percent change since the mid 80s there that we found. And yeah, the central region, I mean, big, big down red arrow. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's not, not looking great. Same thing in the front range. Eastern part, you know, it seems like chickadees are doing okay. Uh, there's no magpies that occur in the eastern region. That's why they're not there. But this is essentially the summary of all that, just in a nutshell. There's a few other things to consider with this. So we were looking at winter abundances. These are winter counts. You know, these are all in December, January, and not the breeding season. So to get a complete picture of this, you would want to check out the breeding season. We do check out the breeding season. So this is a BBS data from what is essentially uh, analogous to that Central Plains region. You can see with chickadees, I mean, right around 2002, early 2000s there, there's just this almost vertical line down. There's a big drop off. Um, that's pretty suggestive that, yeah, okay, maybe this is, again, something definitely happened there. It's very interesting with magpies because there's sort of like three phases of, you know, before the 80s, there's just a, like a very steady decline. And it kind of levels off. Uh, it's still declining, but not too bad. But then yet again, right in that early 2000s range, there's another steep decline. And that's sort of what we saw in our uh, winter data as well. I kind of got this prior history of decline with magpies. I think what is probably happening in this situation is population of magpies in the Great Plains and in Nebraska specifically probably have this multiple challenge scenario that more or less increased their vulnerability. And that's what made West Nile virus so impactful for their uh, abundances because, so again, this is the range map of magpies. We're talking about the very Eastern edge of just the species natural range. So they're already kind of out on the periphery. Again, there's this prior history of decline going on and possible causes of that prior decline, like in the eighties and the seventies, uh, there's a lot of chemicals used for, you know, insecticides on cattle, which magpies will sometimes feed on, um, poisoning uh, just like spoil piles for um, predator control, like trying to get coyotes, but magpies will get into the. Now, a lot of those chemicals have been phased out basically since like 1980, 85. So that's not the sole cause of the decline, but it probably helped. Um, also, just general habitat change. The, the 
increasing development of taking, you know, agriculture right to the river, or, you know, you're developing, a, you know, a suburb or just urban development right to the river, uh, that's going to, you know, really erode, have, you know, the habitat for magpies. So I think, you know, we have these birds that are far away from the source population. They're just getting the slow and steady decline. And then all of a sudden West Nile virus comes in, they're already vulnerable. And it's basically the knockout punch. That, that's my guess of what's going on with magpies there. Um, so to wrap it up, big declines in black billed magpies across the Great Plains in Nebraska. Chickadees also on going down. And it just stresses the importance that, A, these long-term monitoring things are great. Keep, keep you, you know, it's so important. This data is so valuable. And we really need to monitor specifically in our area as black billed magpies. So uh, that's it for me. A lot of great people to thank. Got to thank Audubon and everyone that's ever done a CBC. And yeah, love to take questions if there are any.